Hello, hi, replayers. Uh, wait for a couple of folks to show up. Hello. I am going to start loading my kiln. I have been celebrating birthdays and haven't really gotten much done the last week or so. Um, but I have all the glaze done. I have uh, my little my Scut 1227 here behind me. I actually have my phone on uh, on a little tripod sitting on top of my Venta kiln hood. So I'm trying to be creative in how we get this pulled together. Hi, Audra. Nice to meet you. Um, I am uh, also throwing some test tiles in this uh, kiln load because. Um, I have moved and I, a lot of my uh, my glazes were in storage and I opened up a couple glazes and they were completely unusable, completely unrehabitable. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm just checking my glazes to see if they're going to function and do what I need them to do. I have also, a, I wanted to show you a couple of my, uh, my glaze tests. Let me know if the music in the background is too loud, okay? Um, so I run, I run flat glaze tests as well. Hello, how are you? <laughs> it's nice to see you, Cindy. So uh, this, these are flat. These are going to be flat in the kiln. I want to see what these glazes are going to do with no gravity involvement. Um, I have a glaze here that I'm calling Gawk, uh, which I understand is God only knows, and that certainly describes this, this glaze. It's mostly my beiges and tans and things that um, I don't find very interesting by themselves. Hi, Dana. Um, and I'm hoping that, uh, that it's more interesting all mixed together. I also, this little bit of yellow you see here is Strontium Crystal Magic Warm. And this little bit of white you see here, let's see, hmm, there's some white, there you can see it. Um, that Strontium Crystal Magic Cool. I threw this particular glaze test so that it would catch the glaze on its way down. I suspect this is gonna run like crazy, so I'll be really curious to see how this looks coming out. Um, and so these are the bowls that I've been making, I've got uh, little uh, gallery boutique in Bozeman who has been selling these quite a lot and they need some more and I need to get them to them so uh, this is the base glaze this is only this so I best kiln this is going to be the glaze firing and then there will be the decal firing after this and it changes a lot between this firing this glaze firing and the decal firing uh, different temperatures the crystals do different things uh, and I'm having a little anxiety because I haven't fired this particular run since I've been in this new studio and I just really hope that my kiln is still doing the same thing it was doing when I took it apart 18 months ago. Um, we'll see. Uh, so I see that I didn't get that foot entirely clean. I have a lot of, I have about 22 of these. So I have a lot of these bad boys to put in here. I also did other tests. Uh, and I don't know if you'll see it in the texture, but I wanted to see with this glaze combination uh, what various underglazes could potentially look like underneath. So I have on this particular bowl, it was, you know, I pulled it out of the kiln. It wasn't exactly as good. It didn't pass muster, so it turns immediately turned into a test tile. Uh, so I've got some black underglaze on here. I've got some green underglazes on this one. I have one of these bowls. Uh, it has red iron oxide on it. I want to see how the red iron oxide plays with the decals. Uh, I think that it will help go toward that sort of antique doily look that I'm going for. Uh, I really want it to have this vintage kind of nostalgic feel. Um, I also have one that is test glaze that I painted little flowers on in different under, under glaze colors. Of course, I logged all of that in my notebook, numbered everything, made sure I'd under know what it was when it came out. Uh, so we'll see if this glaze combination works with underglazes. I suspect it won't, but I'm curious. I want to know, so I'm going to test it. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's it mostly. Um, let me show you. So the inside of my kiln 
is, it's a 1227, like I said, it's a SCUT. It has a computer controller on it. Uh, this computer controller uh, is new. I had to replace it. My last computer controller, all the relays melted and all the wiring inside melted. It was a complete mess. I had on the floor underneath, I, when, I, when that happened, it had turned itself on and just stayed on. <laughs> and uh, it, it had melted and there was metal and rubber and stuff on the floor, which was not, not good. Uh, also, this one has a kiln sitter on it, but I actually, when I got the new computer, I, let's see if I, there it is, there's a kiln sitter. So that kiln sitter is actually just sitting in there to keep this hole plugged. There's a hole where that kiln sitter goes inside there. That is not connected, so I don't use the kiln sitter at all. And there was a question I missed, I'm sorry, or I saw something pop up there out of the corner of my eye. Um, I also have cone packs that are kind of old, but I'm going to use them anyway. Uh, they look like they should be fine. This is, again, like the first. Why did it melt? Um, what happened was inside the controller, the relays, apparently the relays that were in this particular controller was a short run of relays that Scott had used. And apparently they had all melted out uh, over time. Mine just happened to do it kind of all at once. And so all of the relays inside the computer, instead of just not working anymore, they just, they, they melted. Uh, and there was no, I, I talked with the guy at SCUT, one of the technical support guys at SCUT, and he said that he hadn't seen any, any other controllers, any other relays do that. It was a kind of a once in a lifetime event. Uh, fortunately, I had a really particularly safe room. As you can see, I have lots of concrete board I put in my kiln rooms. I was really lucky. I was also really lucky or really smart or something. There it is, hope it's back. Uh, so my room was vented um, and I just shut the kiln off at the breaker, let everything cool. Actually it was, I think it was a bisque, I had only just gotten over about a thousand degrees. And so I was also able to save the kiln load once I got a new computer in there. Uh, but it was wild, yeah. It was, uh, it was uh, one of those more interesting experiences. I've also had the plug melt in the wall that's a smell you won't forget. Uh, all that plastic and rubber burning in the wall. Uh, I was very lucky at that time as well. It didn't trip the it didn't trip the breaker in the kiln in the electrical panel. Uh, it just melted the crap out of the outlet and out of the plug. Uh, that has that was replaced as well. So I always 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 fire when I'm home. Only when I'm home. I don't uh, like to just turn it on and leave. Obviously, I've had a couple of experiences where it served me well. So um, I'm going to put the cone pack in. One of the things that I do when I fire is I stagger my shelves inside so that the airflow goes throughout the kiln. If in, in the way the scuts are done and the way my kiln is running right now, it's really hot up top and really hot at the bottom and not as hot in the middle. So I stagger those shelves so that the air moves. Also, because I used to have a kiln vent, you can see, let's see if I can point this out here, that way. See that hole, that's from the Enviro vent that I used to have. And so, let's see here, there it is. There's the third, second one, and there's the third one. So I have these holes in the lid from, uh, from when I had the Enviro vent, uh, now I have the Ventakiln, which actually I'll show you. This is the Ventakiln. This is the lid that I've swung out of the way. I have it on a swing arm because that bulkhead right there is part of my ducting system for my house heat. And so I have, you can see here, that swing arm comes out like this and it's on a weight. And this is my hood. And over here underneath is the counterweight 
and there just is not quite enough space in here under my see that vent right that's my vent for my heat out to my crawl space so there's just not quite enough room so this swings out in front of my display which is kind of entertaining uh, and then I also have to pin back this uh, vent part so that when it's uh, when it's firing it's more of a straight shot and not that big 10 foot long vent um, so anyway I'm gonna start putting in some of these bowls and uh, So I wax, so I glaze in layers. I have my base glaze, which is alabaster satin by Coyote. Uh, and I glaze after I've waxed just the foot. I glaze the whole pot and let, let, let that dry a bit. And then I glaze the interior of that bowl. So that's gonna be white. And then I also glaze the lip. And then I do apply my glaze over the top of that, which is Strontium Crystal Magic Cool. And uh, that's kind of backwards from how we're normally taught how to use that glaze. Usually it's supposed to be underneath, but for uh, some reason, for the effect that I like, uh, it works better on the, on the top instead of underneath. And uh, yeah, so that foot's clean now. I have a cone pack in the bottom. Like I said, these cone packs are kind of old. And uh, We'll see how they do. Um, I am hoping that everything fires exactly like it did the last time I fired it, which was 18 months ago. So we'll see how that goes. And I think that I am going to put my glaze tests on the top shelf. I don't use a lot of kiln wash on my shelves. It's uh, kind of a pain to clean up and I try really, really hard to not have too many glaze drips. In fact, zero glaze drips is the goal. Um, sometimes with the Strontium Crystal Magic, it can be a little scary, a little sketchy. Um, I am gonna add a couple extra, a little bit of extra height in here. And I'll show you in just a second here what I got going on. And I apologize if I'm not seeing any questions. I will check the replay and address any questions in the next scope. Speaking of the next scope, um, I'm gonna start working on getting my decals figured out, making sure that we have, I have all the decals that I need for my next firing. Uh, I know that there are a couple people that are interested in seeing that process. Uh, so that will be coming up, uh, cause I have to, block out pages. I'm going to show a little bit of what I do with my digital photography and how I process that. Uh, so that'll be in the next scope, but if there's any questions on this scope that I can address, then I will. Uh, okay, so here. I'm going to take you down into the kiln. It's kind of an interesting ride, isn't it? So this is a six inch post. Sorry if I'm shaking. I'm kind of short. It's a bit of a reach. Six inch post four inch post and a one and a one and that's to give me that stagger on that original bottom level that will then carry up throughout the rest of the kiln shelves. And these are Corelite kiln shelves so these are not the big monster ones as you can see pretty pretty small amount of kiln wash on there. I do have some glaze bits I've had to grind off, but so far so good. Okay.
house is always just a little precarious. Okay. Now, again, this is just to address the airflow. You can kind of see, I'm going to turn you on your side here and see that gap in there. So this is how it looks from above. Okay, I'm hoping that shows you okay. And then I'm not making anybody dizzy. Also not really trying to do that. <laughs> okay. Another cone pack. Cone pack on every shelf. And I like to set them kind of on the outside. Uh, I'm not sure why I do that. Just because, I guess, more than anything else. Turn this just a little bit more. Here we go. Um, oh, and some of you who saw my last scope saw my daughter Amelia's artwork. I have to say she's pretty creative. She's been painting her pots and uh, that's been a lot of fun. The uh, end result is pretty cute. I didn't get to I might, one of the glazes that didn't make the move was the clear glaze, so I didn't get that. Uh, those glazed, which is kind of unfortunate. I gotta make sure I go get some glaze. Um, They're super cute. Okay, so. Grabbing some six inch shells, six inch posts. these in here. Be curious to see where we're at with these glazes. Looks like I have about one, two, three, seven more bowls to get in and then those glaze tests. So just trying to figure out what the best spacing is for that. I think I can get one more bowl in without anything touching. And there we go. Okay. I have had these shelves break uh, mid firing. They're great for being really light uh, inside the kiln, but just, uh, you know, I'm always checking them as I'm pulling them in and out, checking them for cracks, anything that might be happening. I lost a, you know, they just do, they just fail after being beaten. So it's really important to take care of your shells. And unfortunately, we do occasionally, it sounds just like it goes pop. It's not any, it doesn't, it's amazing to me how it can make this tiny little sound and be such a catastrophic event. Okay, so don't have to worry about space for kiln posts in this top layer. I'll show you this other glaze test that I do. Uh, it's kind of a one that I extruded. And uh, okay, so here's my flat tests. The, the one that catches everything. I'm sure that's going to run like crazy. Okay, so this is, see this is probably a good one to show you. So this is an extruded glaze test. I just run this, you know, just run this through my North Star uh, extruder with the big octagonal die on there. Yeah, that's not quite an octagon. Anyway, so I have a hole that I punched in the back so that I can hang it on a nail. I also have the label in under glaze and then wax. Just a stamp texture so I can see what that looks like. Then a smooth slip trail. Then here I have the Strontium Crystal Magic Warm. Here I have Stra Strontium Crystal Magic Cool and I just have that indicated by a W and a C at the bottom here. 
So that is my standard glaze test, and that kind of should give me pretty much all the information I need about that one particular glaze. Uh, so I did like 180 of those once. I've, had, I've got a lot left. So I put this in here like this. And those flat ones were just rolled out, cookie cutter, grabbed a little texture. So on these flat ones, of course, the same hole so I can hang it. This is just a stamp texture in this corner. And I have, uh, in, I have one perfectly smooth so spot and one sort of not, like it's texture, but it's not super hardcore texture. Because uh, I want to see again how this does on the, on the horizontal plane. And I think just because I'm a little paranoid about glaze runs, I'm going to go grab a couple of lengths of those. Because they work really great. I've heard these called biscuits or cookies. This is just that flat piece of uh, just a slab clay cut out with a cookie cutter. I'm putting that in here. So this is going to catch. So this is the one I think is going to run like crazy. This is the Strachan Crystal Magic. And I'm going to put that underneath there so that can catch any of that glaze that's going to go for it. And here we go. All right couple others just because I think being paranoid occasionally pays off <laughs> and here's that other one this one that I'm expecting to run like crazy all right there it is okay cone pack all right there it is I'm gonna put that one in the middle on the top and that's it so not the most exciting, and I appreciate you guys coming in and saying hello. I uh, have this full now. I'm going to go ahead and run that off. This is, uh, let's see, this is some space in here for my thermocouple. That's looking like that's going to need to be replaced here pretty soon. Uh, but that's pretty much it. I'm going to close this up, move this uh, big beast around, get that vented in place. Uh, then I'm going to program in, I think I'm going to do uh, my regular crystal forming, cooling, controlled slow cool, uh, glaze firing. So I'm going to run her up to about 2160 and then I'm going to hold it for 60 minutes at 2160. That should hopefully bend over that cone 6. Uh, and then I'm going to slow, slow cool it down to 1400 and then I'll let it crash cool at that point. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit longer running kiln, but I get that, that nice waterfall effect, which I'll show you when I go to unload it, and it's probably going to be later tomorrow. Uh, it usually takes about 26 hours from the time I hit start to the time I get in, can get into it and, and unload. So, All right, everybody, that's going to be it. I'm going to wrap this up. You guys have a great rest of your day. Hey, Gary, how you doing? <laughs> Back at you. So I, uh, yeah, so we're going to see how this goes. Like I said, this is the first firing out of this particular kiln. Thanks, Audra. Appreciate it. Um, I have not, well, just wish me luck. <laughs> Hopefully we get the same results out of this one that we've been, that I got out of this before. So uh, in 26 or so hours, I'll see you guys and we'll see if this kiln produces the same work it did 18 months ago. Have a good one. Peace, everybody. Ha, ha, ha.